Immortal Empires has just launched, and now you, the player, have the daunting choice of deciding which of the 80 plus legendary lords you want to play for your next campaign. Or maybe this isn't your first run around, it's your fifth or tenth, who knows, I don't. In this new series, I want to help guide you through deciding which lord or character to choose by giving you a no spoiler breakdown of each campaign divided by their faction or race. I'll go through each legendary lord, giving you a brief summary of their abilities and what their campaign plays like to help you decide which is the right one for you. Now I've organized these from the ones I enjoy the least to the ones I enjoy the most, and this is by no means a concrete fact. You might love one of them more than I do. I I'm grading them more off of my preference, so don't feel like choosing the first one on this list is going to be a letdown or anything. And in this video today, we'll be covering the vampire counts, especially with their new uh, changes with the most recent 2.1 patch. You can quickly navigate to any character that interests you the most using the chapters in both the timeline and the description. And as always, guys, if you you end up enjoying the content please don't forget to like comment or subscribe help me defeat the greatest boss of all time the youtube algorithm let's get started here on the vampire counts campaigns first up on our list is heinrich kemmler now one thing i do want to say with the vampire counts is they all have very strong campaigns even playing kemmler which i think is the more difficult of all the campaigns it's still a very strong campaign the vampire counts have a lot of access to a lot of very fun tools and we're going to go through that here today with kemmler especially so talking about big daddy kemmler looking at his lich master faction effect he gets diplomatic relations bonuses with warriors of chaos demons of chaos beastmen and norska not at all a hint to his end times corruption and fall to chaos but experience gain plus 25 percent for necromancers and tons of ways to get those necromancers out early and immune to undivided and chaos waste attrition as well as a raised dead cost reduction by 10 percent uh, going into his actual traits we can see that he gets Wanderer. Enables replenishment in foreign territory, which is quite nice. You'll be in a lot of foreign territory with Kemmler. Also wins a magic cost reduced for lore of vampires. Lovely. And he starts with the ability Lord of Undeath. This used to be a skill he had to get access to, but this will allow him to summon Krell onto the battlefield a impossibly cool former corn champion white king that is just going to kick some serious ass he also gets master of the dead here which is going to help out with uh, healing some uh, uh, of his little uh, bone daddies as well as focusing mainly on well he gets the ravenous dead too passive ability to ravenous dead for zombie units so allows them to heal so every time they fight in combat it will give them the ability to heal. Now his big focus is going to be on ethereal units, and that's the kind of campaign you're gonna kind of keep in mind with Kemmler. You get Eternal Bastion is his initial thing that's gonna increase um, the power, I'm sorry, combat power of Krell. So he'll be stronger when he comes onto the battlefield, be able to just really rothful stomp things. Then you get into Perpetual Regeneration, which is going to give uh, Krell regeneration, but it also gives Cairn Wraiths and Hex Wraiths regeneration after rank 7. I, I wish that was not the case. I wish it was just a flat regeneration bonus to them, but be that as it may, they do get it after rank 7. Borrow Kings is going to help with your White Kings coming out. Uh, better success chance. You can recruit them and you get 2 plus to their capacity seeker of secrets is going to help out with magic items drop chance post battle drop chance but also a nice 15 percent to campaign movement which you double with this puts you at a nice 20 percent bonus white blades is going to help out with devastating flanker which is a new thing right that's added in with all of the uh, uh sunesh demons so they're going to be helping out any time they charge from the flank or the rear they're going to do way more damage now with uh cairn race and hex race also bonus versus infantry increase because they already have i think I know the Cairn Wraiths... Oh, no, they don't. I thought the Cairn Wraiths did, but they do not have it on their, their profile uh, from the start, but this is going to make them do a ton more bonus versus infantry damage. Then he gets Return of the Lich Master, which gives passive ability, greater arcane conduit, which is really nice. You get access to this, basically, if you think about it, at rank 15, 16, because it's rank 12 to unlock this, then it's like 15 to jump through the available after spending two points. But Winds of Magic Power Reserve chance are changed plus 25% and raise dead cost minus an additional 35%. Let's not forget these little guys here. Thrallmaster uh, is going to help raise dead again. So anytime after battle, it increases that chance. Your Vampire Corruption will increase that chance. Recruitment cost and raise dead cost reduced. So you can see here that Kemmler gets a lot of bonuses to that raise dead. Uh, this is going to help out with upkeep reduction for your zombies and skeletons 
skeleton warriors as well as casualty replenishment rate and battle cap and then um you also get lore master lore of vampires which is cool a cooldown reduction for your lore vampire spells and it wins a magic reduction for a lot of really nice spells and curse of years invocation the heck of course and winds of death um keep in mind too he does get magical animus and undeath resurgent but the nice thing is that the blue line for vampires is very strong undying horde gives casualty replenishment but also the dead rise again uh, and then the children of the night gives character experience as well as upkeep reduction so these are actually very good blue line abilities to get into a mortal horror which will help out again with casualty replenishment rate for that lord and battle healing cap so just to kind of point out here the blue line is one that I, I think that a lot of people always go through but i i think the Early portions of it are always a little lackluster as compared to the latter portions of it. With the vampires, the latter and former portions of it are very strong. So really make sure you take advantage of that. Neckrocker is going to help out a ton with growth here. Eternal Warden with attrition, but Uncanny Prescience is going to give you upkeep reductions, campaign movement range, all those fun things. So keep that in mind with not just Kemmler, with any undead lore that you focus on. And... Also, we get a slew of quest items here. So even though this character is ranked as quote-unquote the worst, he's clearly not a bad character. He's very strong. He has a lot of really cool abilities. The cast Tomb Blade here. Is going to be given some healing, some melee attack, casualty replenishment as well. The Cloak of Mists and Shadows helps out with physical resistance 75%, which is beautiful. Magical attacks, Strider, plenty of awesome stuff here with ambush success chance. Then he also gets the Skull, blah, 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 blah the Skull Staff, which helps out with Van Hale's Dance Macabre um, with some spell resistance, some melee attacks, some miscast chance. So you can see, like I said, he still has a lot of very fun tools and with the new changes to the research tree you could just simply press this button and it's going to give you access to dead rise again a further increase of that attrition but here's your upkeep reduction for crypt ghouls and crypt horrors that's that's neither here nor there it's really these three that are, that are your big winners because they focus on the synergies that already are going to be gathered when you're playing as Kemler. Soul Binder, upkeep and recruitment cost reduction for can race, more goals, and hex rates. Now this, melee attack and weapon strength for the aforementioned three. And now this, barrier, 500 hit point barrier for those three and a battle healing cap of 100% bonus for them. It's a really, really, really sick way to get a lot of benefits out of using your can race and more goals as well as hex rates. And even focusing further onto this, let's jump into Walking Dead. No, Kids of the Night. Nope. Evil Souls, there it is. And now you can get even more melee attack and more spell resistance onto those three. And it's nice that they are in one skill right here. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, you know, taking a look at the building browser, it's going to take a long time to even get to Morngulls, those are tier three building right there. Cairn Wraiths, tier three building right there. Or Hex Wraiths, tier four building right there. That's actually not true. Playing through this campaign, this is kind of why I put this character at the bottom. Um, you are up against a lot of enemies and you don't have a lot of allies it's you're you're far, you're very far away from any other vampire count aside from of course Moussillon and the red duke but he just doesn't really want to ally with anyone you're going to find that you're going to expand to the forest of ardenne quite quickly you're going to be able to take out the Carrick ziflin pretty pretty well enough and you'll probably deal with bastone very well but the problem is that after that you are in a big pinch you are surrounded by wood elves over here grom the paunch over here uh, a pretty mad lowen and then you're going to you're going to deal with like turn three or four aggression from the empire so this isn't a worse campaign in, in that it is bad it is the worst campaign here in that it is going to be very challenging for you because you're going to be beset on all sides and it requires a lot of very strategic planning to expand your little undead empire out of the gray mountains very well strategically like i said so keep those things in mind if you want to play as a character that's going to have a massive ethereal undead stack of doom you can really pull that off with Kemmler. As soon as you go and take Helmgart, you'll probably be able to have enough corpses here from just killing so many things that you'll be able to simply raise dead a ton of Cairn rates and Hex rates into your army. And from there, you can take off soundly. It's just a matter of getting to that point. So that concludes our Kemmler. Let's move Kem Kemla. Kemler. Let's move into another one, another one of our lords. Okay, we've talked about Kemmler. Let's talk about Gorst. And Gorst is a really fun new start position as well as Manfred von Karstein, who we'll talk about next. And 
I, what I really like about Gorst is he is just a zombie machine. That is his focus, and that is a really fun one. So we have Student of Darkness for his faction effect, which is going to give him Bound Spell, Lesser Raise, Dead for Corpse Cart and Mortis Engines. This basically allows those units to summon up zombies. And zombies are going to be the name of the game here. Raise Dead Pool Capacity for Zombies is increased by 4. Casualty Replenishment Rate is increased by 10%, but look at this bad boy. Enables Poison Attacks for Zombies, Skeleton Spearmen, and Skeleton Warriors. That is lovely. You're probably saying, why isn't that on Crypt Ghouls, another focus of his? Well, Crypt Ghouls already have those Poison Attacks, as you can see right there. So when we look at the actual character, we're going to be seeing the Neophyte. Immune to Plague Attrition, lovely because you start right next to Kugoth. Attribute, immune to Contact Effects, again, lovely because you start right next to Kugoth. And then Armor, plus 30 for Zombies and Crypt Ghouls. Let's help put that into perspective. Here is... Yes, I know. Here is a Skeleton Warrior. 20 Armor. Here is now a zombie with 30 armor. Here is now a crypt ghoul with 40 armor. So they outclass zombie warriors as the best tier ones in your army now. And if you then look further into this, um, where am I looking now? Uh, he starts already on his brother's gorse corpse cart, giving him vigor mortis, which is going to help out with uh, melee defense, melee attack, and, and vigor. Unholy lodestone here which is going to heal, and Reliquary of Corruption, which is going to do damage in an area of effect around him. He's immune to contact effects, too. So, uh, I mean, it's it's absolutely lovely, because then when you take a look at his skills, you have even more fun. You get Invocation to Heck, because he's got his whole entire vampire line, but he also gets Awaken from the Grave, which allows him to summon a White King. Master of the Dead is kind of attached to this here, too. So spell number of uses plus one from Awaken to the Grave, and this will progress up to this, increasing that to plus two and reducing the, um, no, increasing the, uh, what's it called? Targeting, targeting range and effect range from um, that ability here. And he also gets Master of the Dead, which is going to help heal as well, as long as the, heal, the leadership is not broken. So you can see he's really stacking lots of summonings here, lots of zombies, lots of fun stuff. Forbidden Scripture gives him 10% research rate, which we're going to talk about as quite nice. Then a raised dead cost minus 15% as well. He also benefits from the same thing that uh, Kemmler did with Thrallmaster and Lord of the Scourge, helping out with upkeep reductions, casualty replenishment rates, battle healing caps, all that fun action. But looking at his unique line, it gets even better. Path to Ruin, campaign movement range and speed. Speed plus 15% for the Lord's army. And that's going to get juicy when we talk about research in just a second here. Unholy Fury, melee attack, for him, that's cool, whatever, I don't care. But plus 12 for zombie units. Add in the Unliving Host, that's a total of plus 20 for zombie units. It's great. Unnatural Toughness is going to give a 10% ward save for zombie units. Uncanny Resilience is adding a healing cap of 500% for your zombies. Then ever onward. Helping out with passive ability, the Ravenous Dead for zombie units. So whenever they're in combat, they're going to heal. And a 50% weapon strength bonus for zombies. It's disgusting. These zombies are disgusting. Whoever wants to be a zombie, not me. I'm just telling you, they're all disgusting. And then if I go into this and I just type in zombie right here, this is going to highlight all the zombie-centric um, technologies. So Risen Standards, Melee Defense. Zombies, Skeleton Warriors, Skeleton Spearmen, all that action. Dead Rise again, cool, but speed plus 25%. So you couple this with the other one, you're looking at a 30 Nope, a 40% buff to the speed of zombie units. If I just were to get this simple technology, my zombies move two speeds slower than skeletons. After it, they're going to be crypt ghouling all over the place. Bonds of Flesh is going to help out with that battle healing cap, now to a total of 600%. Rotten Gift, 20% additional physical resistance to them. And then this is going to help out with Vanguard deployment for your zombie units as well. Risen Champions is going to give more uh, melee attack, that total up to 24 melee attack on your zombie units. Let's take a look at what that would look like. That melee attack goes to just an, a nice standard 29. I mean, zombies aren't aren't amazing, right? You're making them amazing through the virtue of this character. So I'm just showing you that you get a lot of really cool abilities for them uh, from this character across researches, his unique traits, everything. But you also start with the Haunted Forest, which gives you access to the Desecrated Grove, which then upgrades to the, core, the Cops of Sacrilege. And that's a plus, uh, let's just look at rank one here. 
rank four zombies are coming out on turn one which is just absolutely juicy it's very fun it's really cool to take advantage of because you don't have a lot of natural enemies you you have kugoth right here Imric is right over here and then you start to have some fun action with Cathay, but you can actually trade with a lot of Cathay. And you have um, uh, Gold Tooth just right up here as well. So those kind of things are, are uh, important to keep in mind. Now, the reason Gorst isn't higher on this list, the reason he's only like second from the bottom, is because this campaign, by and large, is a, is a little one note. I think that. This campaign's really fun if you want to have a crypt ghoul, zombie themed army, and even then, you can jump into having um, Strigoi ghoul kings that are going to take advantage of some buffs to zombies as well. Here, I'll just pop one of these bad boys up. <clears throat> and you can just see, like, having fun with this guy is going to be fun because you're just kind of like giving some more fun into zombies and into terror guys. And it, it fits into the Strigoi uh, lore and profile of these characters. Command of the Living, you can summon up Crypt Horrors. It's just, again, just having fun with that that theme of zombies and Crypt Ghouls. Um, but, like I said, it is one note in that really once you defeat Kugoth and Emric, you, you kind of have these places open to yourself. So there's not a whole lot of fun. <clears throat> I will say, I think that this campaign will become amazingly fun and a lot more challenging when Chaos Dwarfs eventually inhabit this portion of the Darklands. And because of that, I just kind of put this at this rank, but I definitely think it's, it is absolutely going to be the campaign for you if you want to have an unending tide of zombies ripping through Cathay even or the Darklands. Next up on our list is Manny, Manfred von Karstein, and he is one of the iconic characters in the lore, and he is one that's gotten a brand new start all the way down here in the Southlands. And with that, it is a pretty interesting start. So let's take a look at here, the Legions of the Dam faction effect. Manfred is able to collect the books of Nagash while on his journey for necromantic lore. Gains access to unique buildings in Drakenhof, which is far to the north. Starts with one blood kiss, diplomatic relations plus 20 with vampiric faction and followers of Nagash and research rate plus 20%. So uh, that research rate plus 20% is actually a very strong bonus because you do rely on a lot of research rate with Manfred von Karstein and with the vampires in general. So keep that thing in mind before as we jump through this. Going to his actual trait, though, doo -doo -doo -doo, we have the Dark Acolyte. So winds of magic increased here for uh, reserve capacity, but upkeep reduction for Graveguard and Black Knights, my personal favorite units in the roster next to the Blood Knights. So I do really like that because you're going to be using a lot of them in your... Um, in your campaign now for ability he gets the master of the black arts which is going to give him some spell mastery which is lovely for 18 seconds and he also has a very cool little magic kit so let's jump over here to his skills uh, you can see that he's going to be taking advantage of the lord of death and the lore of vampires which is quite nice he gets life leeching and then he will also get the purple son of Zerius and the fit of buna doom of darkness soul blight aspect of the dread knight and spirit leash here then you can go up to this line and pull from the entire lore of vampires. So he has a lot of really cool um, choices here for uh, magic, and that's and that's awesome. But what you will also see is that he doesn't necessarily have a dedicated line to himself he doesn't have a bunch of unique abilities he do, does get lore master lore of death and lore master lore of vampires but for the rest rest of this for the most part it's kind of standard fair vampire stuff gets red fury and bloodlust like you would expect but gets and he gets greater arcane conduit which is nice so really he suffers from not having any quote-unquote unique skills he's the only lord legendary lord to have a zombie dragon which is actually very powerful especially with the amount of spells he can cast which is really really good as well looking at his quest items he gets the sword of unholy power which is going to be very nice here for power recharge rate magic attacks weapon strength going to be awesome when he's on a dragon of course recruitment cost reductions income all that action the armor of templehof here is also going to give some gives him some regeneration as well as a ward save and physical resistance two really great com uh, things that combine together he's also a very strong uh hybrid caster so typically when you have a dedicated caster character they don't tend to be very great in combat he's still got 90 armor 70 melee attack and 50 melee defense and a lot of these things are really going to even make that even better for him so uh again he still has this awesome blue line so keep that in mind as you're working through this character and really the focus for this campaign is going to be on these books of nagash now the books of nagash are going to be more or less how you get 
access to unique skills because if you think about it unique skills per legendary lord simply buff up a certain thing right they say hey hey you're now going to have better vampires because of this unique skill because i'm isabella von karstein or maybe uh you're going to have better whatever it is because i'm this character and this is kind of how you get it through the books so this is going to give you better uh, effectiveness of all commandments stuff like that but all of these are doubled when Manfred studies the tomes within his malevolent museum in Castle Drakenhof. So as you can see here, Muta Sandstorms, Casualty Replenishment. Um, and uh, for those who didn't know, um, a lot of these are going to be based around certain locations. But some of them, like this one right here, will say, uh, go and defeat Nickel Nicolandor the Blade of Scalarl. And they're named after other YouTubers. So this is named after Turin. This is named after other oh, Total War YouTubers. This one is named after where is this one's named after Indie Pride uh, from Milk and Cookies Total War, Mortgen Rathbringer of Haskinson Haskinesh, and where is the one after Party Elite? There's another one after Party Elite. There it is, Ab Blood Bloodgatherer. That one's after Party Elite. So this is a cool little Easter egg for you, my bros. So. The books of Nagash are going to more or less, like I said, be the focal point of your campaign for your unique skills, quote unquote. And you'll be pushing all the way up here to the Castle of Drakenhof. So it's a very long, arduous slog. So keep those things in mind. And um, when, when it comes down to it, this campaign is different from all the other campaigns because you are in a very wild start position for the vampire counts um you are down here you're going to have demons all around you're going to have skaven all around you dwarfs wood elves mainly a bunch of tomb kings and bretonians as well as empire over in this direction so you have a lot of very spicy things kind of pulling at you from all directions and with this brand new start location it's made manfred very fun and very unique what i will say though it has also made it very challenging. It is a very long journey all the way up to here to uh, Southern Sylvania. So you kind of have to make a decision of how you're going to make that journey. Are you going to solidify this location and then just move all the way up there? Are you going to burn your way all the way up there and make a, a, an undead empire that stretches from the Southlands through the border princes into Sylvania? So that's, I think, kind of an interesting thing about this campaign. It's a campaign where you get to decide how you want to how you want to complete it. Do you want to be more of a vagabond going for these books of Nagash and then settling finally in Drakenhof? Do you want to have a large spanning empire? And I think that that's kind of a fun, different approach. Whereas other campaigns like Vlad or Isabella, the focus is really on the old world. Kemler, the focus is on um, Bretonia. Whereas Gorst, his focus is on the Darklands or Cathay. So... You have very kind of nuanced focuses for those campaigns. So if you want to play this true kind of caster hybrid destructive character that has very strong both Grave Guard and Death, not Death Knights, uh, what are they called? Black Knights, right? Black Knights? Black Knights? Yeah. Black Knights, as well as being probably arguably one of the strongest single lords in the in the entire faction then I think you're really going to enjoy this campaign. But if you want a more focused campaign, I would say that you would want to kind of move away from Manfred into any of the other ones. He's still very strong and, you, as you can see, has a ton of things going for him. But this is many, I think this is mainly for someone who wants to benefit from going wherever they want. And they've played a lot of Total War and they're trying to, they're trying to do a little bit more of a build-your-own-adventure. But that concludes this lord. Let's move on to another one. All right, we're here in the top two between Vlad and Isabella von Karstein. And it's not necessarily fair to talk about uh, these two in the top two because their campaigns are, by and large, effectively the same. You could make an argument that you would choose Vlad over Isabella or Isabella over Vlad for whatever your personal preference is. So just to kind of give you guys a heads up, Vlad is number two versus Isabella because I prefer Izzy over Vlad. And we're going to go into those things right now. So the, the only thing that is different between these two campaigns is the fact that your legendary lord is Vlad. Otherwise, it would be is Isabella here. And outside of that, your faction effect is different. So the faction effect for uh, Vlad is... Starts with one blood kiss, that's the same. Access to unique buildings, that's the same. And starts with Isabella von Karstein as a legendary hero. Obviously, it would be swapped around with, say, Vlad otherwise. But the real, true, unique thing to Vlad is campaign movement range plus 10%. 
that's lovely. It's a very, very good, strong ability. Getting around the battlefield is always, or getting around the map is always a great boon. Now, taking a look at the character details here, of course, he's a very strong character. He does have access to his lore of shadows because he is a vampire, so you can expect to have those things um, all the time. Um, now, looking at uh, his trait consuming thirst battle healing cap is increased when isabella is with him but all units in vlad's army receive vanguard deployment and he has the active ability master of beguilement which gives a reduction to melee attack which is very nice you can just kind of help focus someone down um, outside of that he's still vlad this is the same character from warhammer one and two um his Lines, by and large, are not terribly unique. Uh, you're just looking at pretty much the same things across the board. He doesn't necessarily focus on any one thing too much. Like, he's not like, hey, you're not going to pull out the best um, Grave Guard from this guy. But you do get Lore Master, Lore of Vampires. Always strong. That that cooldown reduction is always really good. Bloodlust is going to go very well on this character, as well as the Red Fury, which is upgraded Bloodlust, of course. Um... So keep those things in mind. Going down the red line is actually very strong for Vlad um, because he is a character that's on foot, which kind of sucks. He doesn't get any ability to move very quickly. So he's always kind of locked at 40 speed unless you give him some way to move. Well, sorry, 46 speed. There you go. <clears throat> so Cloud of Horror is going to give him additional 10% movement range. You couple that with his N810 plus the Restless Den, Dead. <laughs> Restless Dead, you're looking at a 25% movement range for him, which is actually very, very nice. He gets around the map extremely quick, which is cool because he also gets covered on, of undeath meaning you're going to have a just max rank army most of the time he's one of the few characters that you could take advantage of this of these abilities from the red line and actually have them be beneficial i personally don't find as much benefit from these red line capabilities because i very rarely always have rank seven units whereas with vlad covenant on death gets you ton of units especially if you couple you couple this with a white king who can add additional experience per turn mesmerizing aura is going to change here the um uh, Master, of a Begu uh, Master of Beguilement by reducing its cooldown, and it gives you this aura of dark grandeur with a penalty to enemy melee attack, as well as leadership in a 35 meter radius around Big Vladi Dotty. Um, also gets Mortal Levies, which helps out with the range and missile strength increasing of Sylvanian crossbowmen and handgunners. This is part of the Blood Kiss system, which I haven't gone into with any character really, but also gets Diplomatic Relations plus 40 with the Empire and Storm of Night. Both characters get this, um, and it is quite lovely here it's going to be doing um, a good lockdown to any flying unit and does some damage to them with a 60 percent reduction in their movement then lastly he hits monstrous strength which increases the weapon damage and weapon strength of the whole army which is lovely as well as giving him personally sunder attacks which reduces the armor by some everything he hits by th um, 30 so um, it is worth noting too that he gets a kind of custom magic kit of both lore vampires and the Flock of Doom and Transformation of Caddon. Transformation of Caddon is a very powerful ability to just summon a Vargulf onto the battlefield. So I, I did forget about that, and I, I just overlooked it in the discussion, so I wanted to kind of quickly bring that up. With his quest item, so he gets the Blood Drinker, which is a great sword here, which helps replenish his health, um, as well as the innate hunger capability. So he's going to be replenishing a lot of health when he's in combat, um, and it makes him also a pretty cogent melee combatant because you can couple that with the von karstein ring here which gives him damage resistance as well as a ward save of 20 percent and it's nice too that with isabella as his hero she starts with the blood chalice of bathroy which is a really strong healing ability so he she has the ability to kind of keep him up and running now i'm going to focus on her skills and her section but she does get all of her unique skills and to be totally fair with you guys I had ranked him at the very bottom of this list until the 2.1 patch came out, which changed this. She did not have her unique skills. Uh, so it was just a bug. It was uh, definitely an oversight, and she now gets her unique skills so she can have them in her army. But about side of that, talking about the actual campaign for Sylvania, not for just simply Vlad, you're focusing on an expansion out into the old world. And the nice thing is you don't really have a ton of natural enemies until you hit Festus and until you hit both Gelt and Franz. And they're already going to be mucked up a lot with dealing with Festus, dealing with Lowen, 
dealing with um, Marienburg as well as uh, Old One Eye over here, Boris Toddbringer and Kazrak One Eye. So you kind of have Car Blanche to, to to move north and west very easily. Uh, you do have to deal, of course, with Karakadrin. You do have some some dwarfs over there, but you could, by and large, kind of ignore them if you decided to just go fight some some uh, orcs further up north. So it kind of just depends how you want to play this campaign, but this is the classic Vampire Counts campaign. If you want to play the campaign that is focused almost entirely around their lore, right? The Vampire Wars, both 1 and 2, were about expanding out from Sylvania and trying to take Altdorf and becoming the emperor, becoming the, the, the leader of the lands of the old world. So if that's the kind of campaign you're after, both Vlad and Isabella will be the campaigns for you, but I personally find Isabella to be a stronger, better lord. Let's go into why in the next section. So with Isabella, we get a different character than Vlad. Isabella is definitely not the melee combatant that Vlad is, but she has a lot of other tricks up her uh, sleeve thing. Um, it'll still show Vlad as the uh, leader here for Sylvania because he is still the quote-unquote leader technically. But her faction effect is Beloved in Death. Everything's the same, but hero capacity plus 30 for vampires and weapon strength plus 25% for embedded vampire heroes. Guess what? That includes Vlad there, and that makes him a way stronger combatant. And that's pretty sweet. Because she also starts, of course, with another vampire, just like Vlad does. And that vampire can be on a Hellsteed and Barb Nightmare, all sorts of fun things that this vampire typically would have. But looking at Isabella... She has Dark Retinue, which is going to give her melee attack and melee defense for embedded vampire heroes. I love that. I love that because that makes Vlad even better at what he does. Battle healing cap plus 50% when an army with Vlad von Karstein. Keep in mind, if you are playing um, as Vlad, you still get this trait if you have Isabella. So don't feel like, oh man, I'm going to lose that on that trait. It'll be there. Everything's going to be there. The only thing that's changing is faction effect and who the legendary lord is. And I, by and large, again, like her as a legendary lord. Personal preference here. Uh, her magic kit is a combination of both lore of vampires and we get some lore shadow stuff like Pendulum, which is a really strong ability, and Occam's Mind Razor. Now, you can use Occam's Mind Razor on Vlad to make him even stronger. Again, you have this for her as a hero, so don't feel like you're going to miss out on it. I just want to keep reiterating that point. And I like the fact, too, that she gets access to a Hellsteed. So she can be flying through the air, casting a lot of these spells as your lord, and gets a lot of really cool benefits from that. Now, going through her unique skills, not going to lie to you, they're not great. Because this is leadership and melee attack bonuses for direwolves, felbats, vargulfs, vargeists, and terrorgeists. Of that list, Vargeist and Terrorgeist are pretty good. I like Vargulfs a lot, but the rest of this doesn't apply to them. You're going to get Armor Piercing and Passive Ability of the Hunger for Dire Wolves and Felbats. That's not as crucial for me. But back into the Court of Blood, we get more of a hero capacity for Vampires and action and Hero Action Cost Reduction for them than the Ravening uh, Beast. Helps with the cooldown reduction on all characters. Red Fury and Bloodlust, again, very nice. And Storm of Night, we talked about this one. It's going to be that damage per second as well as speed reduction for anything flying. Then Time of Arising. Again, this is nice because it actually goes back to applying um, Wayfarer and speed increase to more than just Direwolves and Felbats. Vargos, Vargeist, and Terrorgeist, which is cool. But I just wish that at dawn they sleep applied to them. It may, I would think it would make her whole unique line way better in my personal opinion. She does get Queen Bee, which is again going to further help out with any kind of hero action cost, success chance, or en reducing the enemies a chance for that. So I do like all those things kind of put together. For her quest item, we still get that Blood Chalice of Bathroy. And again, too, looking at this, when, when Vlad is your hero, he already starts with the things that, with his... Um, uh, what's it called with his items that make him so strong so I really 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 like that about him or her her and him uh, and both of them really with her as the lord and him as the hero and you can of course you know the technologies here uh, you don't really have any technologies that are going to really really help out a whole ton with vampires until like this one uh, oh that's not one uh, this is with the recruitment rank and this one over here is going to help out from crypts and vampire keeps. It's not really going to help out your actual vampires. Uh, but this is the only one that's really going to directly help out putting more vampires into your army. And you do start off with the ability to get vampires in your army right off the gate with the Mausoleum of the Mad Count. Capacity, rank increase, and recruitment cost reduction vastly for all vampires. So 
What I like and what I've always kind of played Isabella as is this leader with a coven of vampires. I'll put Vlad in there, I'll put this other vampire, and I'll usually get one or two other vampires to just kind of fill her army to just make these very strong combatants that can go mob another lord or mob another hero or just kind of just wade through things. They're so strong when used in conjunction, which I really, 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 really like. So you'll like this campaign if you're going to like a Vlad campaign, but you just want to have a lord character that is a casting uh, flying character and more of a support character and less of an actual uh, direct melee combatant here. So it kind of just comes down to your personal preference of which character you want to play. Uh, do you want to play Vlad von Karstein, who's going to be the better... Roman is uh, accompanying this, this uh, recording with some lovely music of his squeaker. But it just kind of depends what kind of character you want to play through. Do you want to play a character that is going to be a better melee combatant? Go with Vlad. If you want to play a better caster support character, go with Isabella. But by and large, I think they both have a very strong campaign. And they have so many tools to take advantage of that I think it is probably the better campaign uh, of all of the other Vampire Counts campaigns in Total War Warhammer 3. That concludes our video here today, talking about all the Vampire Count campaigns. And as I've always said, guys, go ahead and let me know. Is there something I even missed talking about Vlad and Isabella that you want to point out as saying like, hey, that's a really strong benefit. Like I didn't really go into the Blood Kiss system because you can go into stuff like this for the Lahamians using character experience gain plus 20% right there. Or into the Von Karstein right here to help out with getting access to the Sylvanian crossbowmen and handgunners, things that Vlad can give bonuses to. Or the Blood Dragons over here, unit experience experience again stuff that blood that blood that vlad can add into as well but this is raised dead pool capacity or weapon strength even going to necrox this is going to help out the the uh the two human well quote unquote human right gorst and kemler or even shigoi here can help out with your crypt ghouls so do keep in mind the bloodline system is there and it does exist it does need, it needs a little bit of a facelift but it is there so again as always guys thank you so much for watching here today let me know how you're approaching your vampire counts playthrough and do you think maybe gorst is number one on this list because you're having the most fun with him ripping through the unoccupied dark lands in a zombie tide or are you just the king of kemler and you're just been destroying everything as an ethereal ethereal wake upon bretonia let it be known in the comment section below as always guys and let me know what you want to see next do you want to see dwarfs whatever it is i've heard that dwarfs are very uh bugged right now because of their grudges so we might be holding off on that but maybe lizardmen will be our next one whatever it is let it be known as always thank you so much for watching here today have a good one and take care